Welcome to episode 12 of the Stageworthy podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. On Stageworthy, I interview people who make theater, actors, directors, playwrights, and more, and talk to them about everything from why they chose the theater to their work process and everything in between. You can find Stageworthy on Facebook and Twitter at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at stageworthypodcast.com. If you like what you hear, I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use, and consider leaving a comment or rating. Ruth Lawrence is an actor, director, filmmaker, and artistic director of White Rooster Theatre. She's co-founder and coordinator of the Women's Work Festival, now celebrating 10 years of developing new plays by women. She was named the Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council's Artist of the Year for 2011 and was honored with the Queen's Jubilee Medal in 2013. Ruth spoke to me from her home in St. John's, Newfoundland. Welcome uh, to the show, and uh, yeah. um, I'll start with with the the question that that I always start with, and that is, um, why did you choose to pursue theater? Well, I grew up in a really small place in Saint Saint Jacks, Newfoundland, which is in the middle of the south coast of Newfoundland, little town of two hundred people. And I didn't really have any good examples of theater uh, to use as my guide when I was growing up. But I, I did, uh, I, I did learn through CDC that we had a very vibrant culture, and there were tons of local regional programming uh, happening in Newfoundland at that time. So I was used to seeing our culture kind of reflected back to us in shows like The Wonderful Grand Band, Up at Hours, Skipper and Company. Some of them were variety shows. Some of them were sort of sitcoms and some were music shows. So I sort of grew up seeing ourselves reflected on TV. And even though I'd never seen a theater show, I felt that there was a career out there for me. Uh, so once I started getting pretty late into high school, I started investigating the possibilities. And the first school that I could find uh, that did not require an audition to get into, which really appealed to me because I didn't know what an audition was, was a technical theater school in Niagara College down in Welland. So I applied, wrote a really great letter, got some references, got in. And that was really the start to my theater career. Because from there, I was allowed to audition for all the shows that the, that the center did. I had to be on crew sometimes, but I, by and large, I got to perform in those shows. And that was really the beginnings of my theater career. So really, my first experiences on stage were actually in Southern Ontario. So you had not, you didn't have exposure to theater itself until you started uh, like college. Yeah, that's right. I had a high school teacher who came through at one point who was going to start a drama club and we did one drama club uh, sort of meeting and I, you know, we did some rag doll exercises and stuff. I was so jazzed and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But I guess she didn't really see much potential there in the four or five of us who showed up and we never had another drama club meeting. <laughs> that was a bit of a disappointment to me, uh, but I did get a taste and it was enough to tell me that, yep, this was something I wanted to do. Hmm. W were you surprised uh, when you finally started started doing theater at, at what it actually meant? I was in a way because, you know, you no matter what you grow up watching, you're never really quite prepared for the amount of work and the amount of thought that goes into a production and no matter how big or small your part is, you know, you're, you're always on, you have to be thinking all the time. And so I, I think that was the part that surprised me. Uh, you know, when you're watching TV, you kind of go, okay, when the person walks off, they're sort of out of your experience, but it's, it's a very different, yeah, as, as we all know, when we work in theater, you know, once the show starts, uh, you know, there is that, wonderful, beautiful tension, no matter how often you are on or off the stage that uh, you're suspended in from the time the, the show goes up until the final curtain call. Yeah. 
it, and, and it, those are beautiful more moments. Actually, I, I I love those moments. Yeah, so do I. Um, you, you so doing doing theater at uh, at Niagara. Mm -hmm. um, did you complete the program there or did you leave that to go elsewhere? Surprisingly, I did because once I got there, I realized I loved the people, the students that were there doing techno theater, loved their craft so much. And I ended up um, going, it was a two year program with an optional third. I went back for the second year that I had to choose a specialization. So I chose a specialization in costumes, even though I actually loved carpentry too. And my carpentry teacher was actually quite disappointed that I didn't become a carpenter. In retrospect, so am I, because I, it would have really helped me when I renovated my house. <laughs> but I did learn a respect for power tools while I was there. And I've never been afraid to pick anything up. So mm. I took that with me. But I stayed because the first year I did two shows. Uh, and then I saw an opportunity in the next year to just um, get a bit more of an enriched experience. And, and I did. I, I did another show at the, the, the very final one that year it was Absurd Person Singular, which was an Alan Aikburn show, but unlike most of the stuff that he's written. And I, I just had a ball. It was one of the best experiences of my, you know, early college life because I had a lead role. My parents came to see me. As it turned out, it was my the only time my father ever saw me on stage because he died quite young, got sick the next year and died a year later. So it was the only time my father ever saw me on stage was that final production at uh, Niagara. So I, I did actually really enjoy and never regret any of those, uh, any of the time I spent there. Hmm. And did you go straight there from uh, straight from there to George Brown? Well, I'd hope to. I auditioned for George Brown because I, I went up for a visit to friends of mine who were at George Brown while I was still at Niagara, and I just fell in love with their program. I saw the period study, which is just you know the pinnacle for me of the study at George Brown, and I saw that and thought this is the school for me. I auditioned for that program and didn't get in. I got into Humber and went to Humber for one year. And I, the whole time I was at Humber, even though I learned lots and I made incredible friends, some of whom I'm still friends with today, of course, there was just something about George Brown. They, they hooked me. So I went back to audition again. And I remember Peter Wilde saying, didn't we see you last year? <laughs> yeah, you did, but you didn't let me in the school. So I'm back. And he said, well, what if we're just another stepping stone on your way to, you know, to, to find the school you, of your dreams? And I said, well, this is it. I, I don't want to do anywhere else. <laughs> and I think that actually got me in. I, I don't that think probably did. Audition. That probably did. Yeah. There's no way it was my audition. I didn't improve that much from one year to the next. I really <laughs> think it was those words. He kind of, he took a chance on me. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, Though that program uh, for so many people who who went through it is is pretty it's an intense program, and uh, is definitely uh, it changes you in a, in some some good, and I guess some people might some people everybody's mileage varies, but it definitely mm -hmm. is a is a challenging course. Um, totally, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change not one month, not one not one scene study, not one course, like everything about that. And like you said, there were things I didn't enjoy, but I, they came back to me, you know, at some point in my career for the last 25 years, they, those, everything I learned there has come back to me in some way. Well, it's, it's funny because it is a course that I remember when I was in first year, Peter Wilde said, um, something to the effect of, you may not understand the things that we're doing now, but one day in the future, you will understand exactly why we're doing it. And yeah. at the time I said, you are so full of shit is what I, I thought to myself. And then about 10 years later, I was like, oh, now I understand. I know the penny drops. And like, that's the thing, like the penny keeps dropping. I feel like, you know, like, and, uh, and it's true. eh? like, I, I, I remember having that moment too, where I was like, you know, we're young and we're thinking, oh my God, really? Do we need to know this stuff? And yeah, the truth is you do. <laughs> well, it's funny because I remember, I remember thinking, you know, why are we taking all of, why are we spending all this time in theater history class? Exactly. And, you exactly. know, just being lectured at for an hour every, every week, but 
now, of course, I understand exactly why. I know. And like, like I've gone back and reread so many of those plays. <laughs> you know, he'd be very proud of us, I think, you know, Phil. He'd be very proud mm. to hear that. But I it's so. true. Yeah. And uh, I teach sometimes now. I, I've taught a couple of times at the theater school in Cornerbrook. Uh, I've taught as a master class teacher. And I've also taught here at Munn in their drama specialization. And I, I hear myself saying the same words that those teachers have said over the years to me mm -hmm. and doing remarkably a lot of the same exercises. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny how much, you know, those are the, those are the exercises that we fall back on so often. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like I actually feel a little pang of jealousy when I'm teaching them to my students because I, I want to go back and do it all over again. <laughs> I actually, I caught myself saying a little while ago that, that um, I would like to go back and do those things again, knowing what I know now. Yeah. Um, sort of with the wisdom of age and not the impatience of, of my youth. I know. The zone of silence. Like, it. oh, it would be so nice to go back there. Yeah, it totally would. When you finished theater school, how long did you go straight back to Newfoundland or did you stay in Ontario for a while? I didn't go straight back because I auditioned for a couple of, of summer seasons and I got one. Uh, so I actually left school and went directly to Port Colborne and worked at the Showboat Theater. That I don't know if that theater is still there, but they had a little summer season. And I went mm -hmm. down and worked there. I did. I performed in two shows. And I was, I think I was the costume mistress for one in the middle because of course I had, you know, the, the costume background. They're like, oh, we could keep you on the whole summer. And I went, yeah, of course. I was a new mother because I had Luke. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'll do that. So I stayed that summer. And while I was in um, Port Colburn performing, a friend of mine came to visit me and told me about an audition for a show back in Newfoundland. And I knew I was, at the time I planned to go back because me and my partner, Luke's dad, were getting married. So I thought, oh, I, I should audition. So I set up an audition. I can't even remember how I did it. I, I feel like I had a phone interview, and she said, okay, yeah, you'll audition when you get back in St. John's. So I came back. I auditioned for her, and she said, well, the show's cast. I, I can't hire you. And I probably did the smartest thing of my career. I said, well, isn't your show about rural Newfoundland? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, who in your cast is from rural Newfoundland? <laughs> and she said, no one. And I said, I think you need me. And what could she say to that? <laughs> she said, well, maybe. Um, okay, I'll do this. Why don't you come in and work with us for a couple of days? We'll try out. And if it works out, then I'll figure something out. And so after, after the end of the first day, uh, I thought, oh, this is, you know, I, I didn't know how this was going. And then, and then I came back for my second day and the assistant director said, don't worry, don't worry. Your trial's over. We're hiring you today. <laughs> and that was it. Like I, I got that job and then I went basically from job to job. I, I, mm. I don't even think I've ever, I don't think I've ever auditioned for anything outside of Newfoundland since that. Cause one job led to the other, led to another. Mm. I, I made a whole community and network here and um the only time i've left here to do shows is when i've toured things and one time i did a co-production between rca theater our local st john's uh theater company and tarragon and i went to tarragon to do hmm. six weeks in toronto hmm. so i've had a pretty full career here i've been really lucky yeah i mean there's there's you sort of mentioned something in passing uh about uh you mentioned your son, Luke, mm -hmm. and uh, you had Luke. So you were pregnant with Luke in second year? Yeah, I got pregnant mm. in the fall of second year. So by the time I finished my second year, I was quite pregnant. And like, it just was very fortunate that his, he, his birth date uh, was predicted to be July turned out to be perfect. He came on yeah. the 7th, 8th of July and uh, he was six weeks old when I went back for my third year. And I remember when I got pregnant, um, I think um, it was funny because I kept thinking, oh, they're all really skeptical. They mm. think I'm not coming back. But at that point, as a pregnant young woman, 
23 years old, I didn't really know what my options were because I thought, well, now I, I got to work as soon as I get out of school because I, I got a child to raise. So I didn't see any other choice than to finish school. So I told them I was going to come back and they said, look, come back. And I remember Peter Wilde actually in the room, it was him and Heiner and Peter said, I think you just need to come back and take it one day at a time and see what happens. Mm. And I said, yeah, if you'll let me do that, that's what I'd like to do. And he said, yeah, of course we will. And that's what I did. I, like I never looked beyond the next day because every day getting to school was hard. There's that's no lie. Because <laughs> uh, I had, you know, a child. I had my my child's babysitter was across town. I lived in High Park. His sitter was in, uh, lived in uh, Gerard and where was she? Gerard and Coxwell. And then the school was at King and River. So I basically crossed the city and then doubled back halfway to get to school every day. And then I'd get home. So because I was in third year, when I went back, uh, we also had, we had classes all day and then rehearsals all night. So I would usually get home like at midnight because I'd go get yeah. lit after, after rehearsal, usually at a student's house, <laughs> a first <laughs> or a second year would have them, or they'd come to the school and take care of them. And, uh, I was getting home at midnight and then getting up again, like five, six o'clock in the morning. So every day it was hard. And, you know, babies come with lots of illnesses and lots of needs. So yeah. I never, yeah, I never quite knew what the next day would bring. I was also really broke. So I was doing my own uh, laundry for cotton diapers and I was nursing. And yeah, it was, it wasn't an easy year. By the time the year was up, I was physically exhausted, but man, did I ever know myself better. I'll bet you did. <laughs> I knew a lot more about myself than I would have in any, yeah. you know, otherwise there's that, that's for sure. Hmm. Yeah. And I, and I, I got better as an actor. There's no doubt about that because suddenly uh, there was just something, it, there's just something that makes you a lot less selfish when you realize that there's another person that depends on you. That's true. I was actually going to say, I was going to suggest that maybe that might have also been because you were so tired. And I was tired. You, you cannot fake it when you're tired. That's so true. And I'll tell you one thing. I was certainly in touch with my emotions. <laughs> I always knew. You know, and there were just things. Uh, yeah, there, there, there was um, an appreciation for life somehow that I didn't hadn't had before and how delicate it was. I, I, it's really, it sounds a little bit corny to say it, but there was something that changed entirely. I, I felt like my level of empathy went way up and um, yeah, I suddenly could kind of put myself in, in someone else's shoes. And, you know, before that, you know, I was concerned with all the things that a college student is concerned with. And, and many of those things really went to the back burner. Uh, you know, when you, when you got a child that's, dependent on you every day uh it's yeah it was it just changed everything and, and i'm yeah. telling you for me uh, i mean i i say this a lot when i talk to to theater students like i had the best people around me at george brown like i mean everyone there contributed in some way whether it was just giving me the support mm. uh, or a kind word uh, you know i never yeah, I, I can't overstate it enough. Everybody there was just uh, instrumental in me finishing that. And in some ways, I, f I always felt like um, having a baby in the school kind of humanized everyone. A lot of the pettiness that I'd sort of seen in years ahead of me, it all fell away. I, I didn't I didn't see that anymore uh, once a baby was suddenly around. And that was a really great effect. I, I saw it in everybody from my third year class to second years and first years too, because a lot of times like you might've even held Luke. Like there was, I felt like everybody in that school had a hand in kind of doing something at some point. You everybody know, I think had a, took a turn looking after him. I remember. Definitely. I think, I, I think I, 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 or somebody else might've commented that, that that year uh, Luke was the baby that was raised by the community. Oh my God. Absolutely. Like, I, there were times when I'd be doing shows that I'd walk off stage and like, basically someone would put him in my arms. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, like, you know, you can't get more real than this. So yeah, yeah. it was pretty, 
it was pretty amazing. And I, and I, it's funny because now even through Facebook, I, I see some of the people who, you know, would babysit or, or would do like little things for me. And, and I always go, Oh, look at that. I, rem- I remember so much, you know, mm-hmm. that person or that student. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it certainly has given me a, a stronger connection to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So then when you, you returned to, to Newfoundland, you've been working uh, since, um, going from Toronto in, in, and, and I think that although George Brown tries to prepare people for uh, a, a career in theater in Canada, mm-hmm. since it is based in Toronto, a lot of the knowledge comes from the, the Toronto theater community. Mm-hmm. Did you, what did you find different when you arrived in the theater community in in Newfoundland? Yeah, that was certainly probably in some ways my biggest awakening, but also it wasn't that far from what my expectation was because when I I knew when I came back um that I was probably going to be creating a lot of my own work. I didn't quite realize how much, but I did know that uh you know, I was probably going to be doing a lot of things uh, where I had to write my own my own work. And that's, that was like the first thing, the first job I got when I came home, it was a collective. And that was a really big tradition here. It's actually kind of fallen off a lot in the 25 years since, but the first four or five years that I was back here, I was writing collective works all the time. So that was one thing we hadn't done any work on in George Brown, because of course, yeah, they're, they're preparing you for your life as an actor, not to be a writer, actor, or writer, director, actor, or a producer. So I very quickly realized that um, if there were stories that had to be told here, I might have to be the one telling them. Um, now we do, of course, also have some incredible playwrights here, but uh, you know, you might get a job doing one of those productions a year, and the rest of the year, I knew I was probably going to have to be creating a lot of my own work. So in the early days, in particular. I did a lot of writing that probably changed a fair bit. uh, I'd say within seven or eight years, because people started getting more into the Canadian model, you know, where there was a playwright or like co-writers. And now it's almost, almost entirely uh, single, single writer shows. Hmm. But in the beginning, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a big awakening was realizing I'm going to have to write too, but it was also, you know, a beautiful thing because I had such freedom uh, to be able to create my own characters for those shows. It's, it's, it's interesting interesting. because they, when we were in theater school, they couldn't know how integral the self created theater was going to be, how, how important, how big the indie scene was the do it yourself theater scene was going to be no. they were preparing us for what the the common experience was at the time yeah like you go in and, and, and audition for stratford and shaw and all these big companies uh and the regional companies too like that was really what i kind of had the impression my my career was going to be until luke was born and then and that did change my uh world view and i thought i am gonna need to be working a lot more Mm -hmm. Uh, then I would have had the liberty to, and I thought I can't be out, you know, working as a waitress to support myself while I beat the streets and audition because I I knew I had a child to support. So that was actually one of the things that led me back home. Even though it had always been my intention to come home after theater school, like when I, when I left to go and I thought I'd always come back, but you know, as you get into the training, like you said, you know, you're like, you're being prepared for a different kind of industry. And so I really started going down that road. Having Luke changed all again. And I, and I went, Oh, okay. I, I'm going to go home. <laughs> and, and I don't regret it for a second. Cause I, like I said, I basically arrived here with a job uh, within a couple of days and I haven't really, well, I've never had to take a job outside the industry. That's pretty miraculous. Yeah, it is a miraculous. I, Like, it's a beautiful thing. I've worked in film. I've done lots of tons of different kinds of jobs within theater and film. But yeah, I'm I'm really lucky. I don't know. You you started your own theater company there as well? I did. Yeah. So uh, about 10 years in, uh, I started a company called White Rooster Theater. 
I, I kind of had a, a meeting in the minds with a, 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 re, a fr- someone who's become a really good friend, Sherry White. And we started working together on a show and just, you know, fell in love with each other's way of working. And, and I knew, okay, I'd found someone that I could, that I could probably uh, forge a career with. So we started writing a show together and in order, well, at least we thought that in order to produce it, we were going to have to start a company. So we blindly went in, incorporated this company and we didn't even have a name for it. So when we were, you know, when we, when we finally had to put the, the application in, we were like, well, what are we going to call this? We came up with all kinds of corny names and I said, well, we got to call it something. And she said, well, what? And I said, well, let's, um, let's just use our names. And so her last name was white and I was like, no, White Lawrence, White Ruth, that doesn't sound right. And I went, oh, well, my friend Shane Marie Kasner used to call me Rooster as a nickname. She said, yeah, perfect, White Rooster, <laughs> call it that. And, and the irony about that company, it's called White Rooster Theater. And it's a, it's a fo- its mandate is to produce the works of women playwrights. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, the, you know, the irony of it being a rooster did not hit yeah. us for some time after. <laughs> <laughs> but then we kind of liked it. We thought, oh, yeah, well, okay, that's unexpected. So, yeah, we, we have our own theater company. And now it's uh, going into its 16th year. It's uh, We tour across the country. Uh, we've taken on the development of a couple of really great playwrights. And we've been really privileged to do the work of other incredible playwrights. Two years ago, we produced Catherine Banks's um Governor General award winning play. It is Saw by Walking. And uh, that was her second GG award. And I felt so privileged to have the opportunity to co produce that and to be in it. So, uh, you know, we, we've actually, by focusing our mandate uh, on women, we've actually, boy, we've, we've had some great opportunities come our way. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we, we get Canada Council funding on a regular basis now. And, uh, yeah, we're doing okay. We're still project by project, which is okay. In this climate, I think I prefer it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we, we work a lot. We, we do at least one production a year and usually some development as well. And uh, it does – just to – just because I'm always fascinated by the way that an, a, a small company – uh, manages to, 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 to fund its work. Do you do all of your work through Canada council? Do you have sponsors? Do you do crowdfunding? Uh, we don't, uh, the, I have to say the one thing that I really, uh, wish we had, uh, a better grounding in here is corporate funding. And we, we really have so little, it's, it's actually shocking. Uh, so we, are pretty much public fund, publicly funded. We get funding from Canada Council, from our Newfoundland Labrador Arts Council. We have a c- city funding. We also have another government program that sometimes contributes. And then besides that, it's ticket sales, you know, some advertising, and and we do do some um, crowdfunding, but not often because everyone seems to be at that these days, and it's just a little harder to go out and look for look for the money when when everybody's kind of asking all the time. Yeah. So we've, uh, but w- you know, so far so good. We've, we've always managed to make our budget. We've, we've never yet been in a position where we couldn't pay people what we promise we pay them. We pay national standard for, I think every position that we hire, it, it just means that sometimes we do smaller projects. So we don't always, um, you know, we just did a, a five person show. That's our biggest show ever. Usually it's, it's a two person show. Hmm. So it just limits the scope of the project sometimes, but it never limits the creativity. No, sometimes I find that uh, when you have a limitation, like a limited budget, you have to get more creative in how you're going to produce. And that can yeah. that can lead you in places that you never would have been able to go if you had all the money that you might want. Yeah, that's right. And, and actually, it, it, it's meant that... Um, that a lot of times there's a, there's a certain beauty that comes out of it. Like we've a few years ago, I was doing a show and I realized that the only place I could possibly cut my budget was in the materials. And I thought, okay, I don't want to cut the designer, but I, I'm very limited in what I can spend on materials. And so I, I was looking at this show and I thought, what, 
like, how are we going to do this? Because I also knew that I wanted to tour it. So uh, I had a chat to the designer and I said, okay, how about we try this? How about we just agree right now that we're going to do this whole play and we're not going to have any wood anywhere on stage. And the designer, you know, sort of thought that over for a few seconds because, you know, I was a good designer. (laughs) And uh, she said, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know if I can make that work, but I'm willing to try. And it was actually a big set because it was, uh, it was a show about Stockholm syndrome and the main character was a young girl who was captured. uh, Not unlike the, the novel room that came out like a Mm. year after we did our show. Um, and so she had to create a space where a girl was being held captive without using any wood. Mm. And she did it. (laughs) it was extraordinary. She used aluminum framing from uh, a projector and, um, and wool. So she, Mm. she made the frame of the house and then she used wool like a spider's web to do the walls. And I I thought that was just brilliant. And uh, you know, she sold me. And so now my motto for the theater company, my, my, uh, my, uh, I, I guess you'd call it my kind of um, go-to motto is no wood. And, and that's where I start every design conversation from now. Hmm. That's interesting. So yeah, they, they, it's, it's, and, and you know what, Phil? It's actually meant that we have put off some extraordinary shows. Now, we do use wood when we need it. Obviously, like it's pretty hard to have furniture, uh, like a table. And not have wood, but it's. But I always ask that they make it um, not their first choice. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's just meant that we've had some pretty interesting uh, set designs, and we've been mm. able to tour everything. The last show we did, um, the conversation with the designer, because there was five people in it. I said, okay, I'm going to pay you this design fee. The more we can take out of this set, the happier I'm going to be. Uh, with this production. So she started with kind of a set design in mind and, and we just all work together, her, the director and the cast to say, okay, can we get rid of that? We don't need it. Okay. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of this. So, so by the time we were done, everything fit in the pan of a truck and it was, you know, again, it was meant to be uh, a kitchen sink drama really and we had no walls. We had some curtains and a couple of pieces of furniture, but it was really just a process of elimination. We went into it, taking things away. And, and every day we just, we started out with a whole bunch of props and every day we took something away. We said, mm. can we do without that? Yep. Yeah. And we just got rid of it. So by the time we actually did the show on stage, everything that was on that stage was essential. Everything. There was not one decorative piece that that wasn't used. Hmm. So it, it's it's been a really good um, experience, and from that uh, from that perspective too, I can definitely see the the how. Oh. You know, well, I mean, I was thinking about you know when everything is absolutely necessary. I've seen you know we've all seen so many sets that are. Uh, comprised of things that you know they look good or they you know they set the scene but you could do without them oh my god Um, I I feel like I watch most shows uh, I go into a theater and I look at the set and I and I I sometimes just have a visceral reaction I go oh you you know that what what they could have done with that money besides this because I feel like I don't need it most most of the time I just need the actors to be honest you know like maybe it's the point in life that I'm at, but I, I just want to really feel what those actors are feeling. And, and sometimes I can imagine things that I, I just don't need to see them, you know? I remember. Yeah, I do know. Yeah. And uh, the other funny experience that we had, uh, this is one of our first touring experiences. We, we, we took a, a small show, three person show uh, across Canada from, from, went from Newfoundland to 
uh, Winnipeg. So not quite all the way across, but we, again, it was one of those things of like narrowing down, narrowing down. Sherry White directed the production. It was written by a Toronto writer named Shannon Bramer. And, uh, we actually played it at the, at the fringe in Toronto and, and we got, um, we got, we got, uh, sort of noted as best ensemble by Glenn Sumi and John Kaplan. So we were pretty chuffed by that. Uh, but we, so everything traveled in one suitcase, one garbage container, cause it was a set piece and a whole bunch of stuff could fit in it. And, uh, what? And, and one cardboard box. And I remember when we arrived in Winnipeg and the stuff started coming out on the carousel, we were at one end like of the carousel in the airport. And we could see like all the people that were gathered around the carousel over on the, the, the far end where, where the stuff was starting to come out. But, like it was almost like a, watching a, like a, a domino or something because we could see all the people like looking and they and their heads would turn and they'd look at each other and they'd giggle and they'd chat like as something was coming yeah. along this conveyor belt and we, we were kind of like what's going on it was like just this just little like wave of giggles that was kind of going in this really odd shape around um, this airport I think it was like an m-shaped conveyor belt and by the time we could see it. We realized, oh my God, it's our garbage can that had been painted blue and, you know, it was all taped up. And people were like laughing at the fact that there was a piece of luggage that was a, <laughs> that was a steel garbage yeah. container. And we were like, oh my God, we're at the end of the conveyor belt. And we, we too, of course, were starting to giggle by now. And then we realized, okay, this is the moment we've got to pick it up. So we, two of us reached in and grabbed the garbage can and put it on the floor and the whole airport applauded. <laughs> We're like, you know, we just stood up, I stood up on the edge of the conveyor belt and went, if you like the performance of our garbage can, please come to the Can West Center from Thursday to Saturday. And you can see Mona Rita in which this garbage can has a stirring role. And they <laughs> applauded again. And we were like, oh, well, that, that was like, you know, on the spot fringe marketing right there. Yeah. yeah. So you took that show to the Winnipeg Fringe as well as the yeah. Toronto Fringe? It actually wasn't the Winnipeg Fringe. It was FemFest. We got invited to the okay. Fest. So we did Toronto Fringe, Hamilton Fringe, the, and the Atlantic Fringe. Mm. And then we did a date in St. John's, and we did one in, in Winnipeg. And I think that was the five cities on our tour. Did you go in that order? Because that's sort of like a circular. It was all over the place. Yeah, oh. we, went, we did. We, we started. That's exactly it. We went St. John's, Toronto, Hamilton, Winnipeg. Halifax back to St. John's again. It was, it was a very strange, uh, it was a very strange tour. Well, you do, you do them in the order that they come in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we had a ball. It was, again, it was one of those things where we met so many people. And, and you know, the funny thing that came out of that was that after we had done that, um, tour a couple of years later, I did, I just, just to try it out, I did a Groupon, um, uh, sale thing on one of our shows. Like, I think we had four shows and I said, okay, this one night, like the preview night or something, I'm just going to do a Groupon for. So, you know, we sold all the tickets for 10 bucks. We got $5 and I did it because I thought, okay, I want to get a good crowd out for the show. But then I also was really uh, keen to get my hands on some audience demographics just to kind of see like who's coming to the show and, and, yeah. you know, you know, obviously they're not willing to spend that much money, but I thought, okay, these are the people who are, are curious about our company. And when I got the demographics back, uh, I was shocked because this was like about two and a half years, maybe three years after we'd done that tour. And I do, I have no idea how and why, but when uh, the tickets were bought, we noticed that there were tickets sold out of Winnipeg. They were bought in Winnipeg and Toronto, Hamilton, Vancouver, for some reason, and two or three places in Nova Scotia. And we went, oh my God, like those are all the places we've been with shows in the past. So somehow or another, I don't know if people who had seen us up there were now living in St. John's or were going to be vacationing here. They saw the Groupon and they bought tickets to come see the show. Mm. So it really proved to me the power of touring and kind of building that national audience because, you know, the, the person who sees you in Winnipeg this year might be in St. John's next year and are going to come and check you out. So 
it, it was enlightening. Yeah, yeah I, I remember know. doing a uh, fringe when I was on the fringe tour. There were people who had in a couple of the cities that we were in, they'd been there before and they were, they were commenting on how valuable it was to do that first year, maybe struggle through that first year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe the first half of their fringe uh, festival in say Calgary didn't go very well, but then the second half went better as word got out. And then when they came back the next year, how many people uh, sought them out and came right from the start? Yeah, exactly. I know. And you can never predict, like we had such great audiences in Toronto. We were so, like, you know, we got word, word got out early about us because we had a good review and people were coming. We, we were in the Bathurst Street Theater, so we had great, mm. great space and, you know, nice and central. And, you know, we, we were so spoiled. It was our first fringe and we were like, wow, this is so great. Lots of people are coming out. Then we went to Hamilton and <laughs> we were dead in Hamilton. Like no one was coming out. And it was a heat wave. Like uh. outdoors in Hamilton, it was like being in a firebox at a stove, like Oh, it was unbelievable. The, the Salvation Army was actually going around handing out water to people on the street because it, the heat was so hot and no one was coming out at night. How long and ago was that? That was 20, was that 2011? I think it might have been 2011. Mm. I feel like it was a, yeah, I feel like it was about five years ago. Yeah. Oh boy. It was just, well, I'll tell you, Kim's convenience was playing in the same theater that we were in, uh, at Bathurst. Mm -hmm. We saw everything that played alongside of us. And I think we also benefited a bit from that too, because they were getting amazing crowds when we go on after them. And so people were, you know, coming to see our show. You get the the people people. who couldn't get tickets to Kim's convenience, which is, you know, it's a good spot to be in that following a hit show. Absolutely. And we went to see it. We're like, Oh my God. God, like they had sold out for very good reason. It was a great show. And and we were like, wow, like these guys are packing them in. But we were also kind of benefiting from that. So we didn't do badly by being, uh, you know, by being there close at hand to them. Proximity really helped us. And then, and then we went to Hamilton, you know, we were in a non air conditioned, uh, theater or actually I think the air conditioning broke in the theater that we're in. It was kind of a makeshift theater. And I, we, I, we went out one night to do it and they said the air conditioning broke. And we said, okay, well, we're not performing. They went, well, there's eight people here who really want to see it. <laughs> Sarah Tilly and I looked at each other. She was my co-performer. And I said, like, oh my God, eight people? We're going to die in this heat. Yeah. And we said, okay, look, tell them. We'll give them free tickets to come tomorrow. Like We just can't perform in this. And the stage manager came back and she said, well – six of them can't come back and they've heard great things. They really want to see it. So we did the show and honestly, Phil, the only thing I can remember from that whole experience that night was watching the sweat drop off of Sarah's face and feeling it going down (laughs) my back in a river. river. I was like, "I I don't even remember anything about the show except how hot it was. So that was that was that was that experience. But you know, having said that, it was really nice to know that there was at least six people who wanted to see the show so badly that they weren't that's, going home until that's they did. well, that's good. Yeah. So that was I, I remember doing I think it was in Edmonton doing uh the play that we were touring, which was it was a play in the style of the silent film. So we're all in white face. Oh yeah. Um and they would turn the AC off when the show would start. Right. Um, of the just so that because of the noise, uh-huh. which makes sense, but that the theater that we were in was like this this serious furnace. Oh. So we would have these lights, and uh, we would, and we're already caked on with with white makeup, and and uh, we'd finish and just sort of <laughs> see how how much of how much did my makeup stay on? Uh, would it look at the white splotches on the stage from where the makeup came off? Oh my god! Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. And don't envy that at all. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, we're spoiled here because, you know, uh, apart from the occasional warm day, we just don't have that experience really, mm. even in the middle of summer. So, uh, so I don't have to, I don't have to face the, the heat and humidity uh, of, of a theater very often, but I do remember that. And boy, that was, that was a tough one. <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, we, in in the Toronto indie scene, people talk about a lot is where's the audience going? 
So people yeah. are, you know, they see the audience going, you know, the Mervish theaters, you've got the big shows mm. and you've got uh, factory tarragon Pasmerai still struggling for their audience, but s- scraping by and everybody's sort of wondering what is happening. Like how w- for indie theater, where's our audience? Um, and do you find that, I mean, I picture, and maybe I'm wrong, but I picture the, the, the Newfoundland culture as being more friendly to the arts and the arts being more integral than they are here. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a, a, a false, is that my, my seeing, uh, Newfoundland as the promised land for the arts or is that, well, um, you know, it's an interesting dilemma because if you talk to people here, uh, a lot of them will say the same thing. Like we're what we're seeing right now is definitely it's a proliferation of musicals the big shows those are the ones you know the, the it's the amateur and the semi-pro shows that are in the biggest theaters here and the professionals are in the smallest theaters because we're having the hardest time getting people come out to see drama comedy doesn't matter what it is like if it's if it's not a musical it's harder to get an audience. And for a while there, I actually thought, oh, it's cost, it's cost. And then I realized, no, like they're paying. Even here, like now I know this is probably a cheap ticket in Toronto, but like here they're paying like anywhere from 60 to a hundred bucks to go see a big musical. Mm -hmm. And yet the theater companies were charging between 20 and $35 for a ticket, which is like, that's cheap theater by most accounts, but here we were like, no, no, it's the cost. Like people aren't coming to see it because of the cost. And so I thought, no, that's got to go out the window. We can't be thinking it's the cost because, you know, the public funding is subsidizing these tickets. So yes, you know, if you want to see good theater, you're going to have to come and pay for it. But yeah, I'd say that we're having uh, similar dilemmas here. And part of what's happening too, is that we're losing a lot of performers that used to uh, just make their home here and work here only. Now they're starting to move out more often. So uh, like when I was casting the show that I did in November, uh, we started casting and out of five performers, we had to bring in, now they were Newfoundland performers, but they were living away. We had to bring three out of five in from away, which, you know, made a significant cut into my budget because I had to travel them, put them up and um, do the best I could to provide like proteins and stuff for them. So that really ch- has changed a lot of the way we're doing things here. There's definitely less uh, professionals who are starting companies. Uh, we're still around, but not many others have like kind of followed in our path. There's only a few Artistic Fraud is one of the big companies, a little bit older than us. They're, I think they're 20 years old now. And, you know, they're still based out of here. But they, from the beginning, they've always taken their work on the road. They kind of develop it, you know, get it ready here, and then they take it on the road. And that's really the model that I've uh, followed uh, for the last five or six years is I said, okay, well, like, we got to do what they're doing. We have to develop the work here and then go find our audience because, we do have some audience here, but it's not big enough to sustain the company. In fact, I, I am doing a show right now that is going to open on Thursday night. And at the moment, like, we don't really have that many tickets sold. Now, we've got a guaranteed fee because it's a show where we've done before and it's being presented. But, you know, we still want people to come out and see that show. We want course, the theater yeah. that we're performing for to have a good audience, you know, to, to do a box office that's worthy uh, of having presented us, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, like we're struggling to figure out. Okay, wh- where is that audience? Where are they going? What are they going to see? And uh, how do we get them in our seats? So, has so there I been a change? change? Has there been a change? Has there been a change? Did they used, used to come and then they have stopped coming? Uh, I would say more so. Yeah, like um, now, not when I first came home. 25 years ago, you know, it was still, you know, you had to work hard to get people in. It got better when the economy here got better. People went out more, that's for sure. But in the last three or four years, it's definitely, it's harder 
to get audiences. We like White Rooster, I feel like is in a good position because we do have a good, strong, loyal audience. They know that when they come see one of our shows, it's going to be good quality. They're going to see good performers. What, what they're getting for their money, they feel confident in. So I feel a little bit like that makes it a bit easier. But, you know, even if it, like I want people to go out and see the emerging artists, too, because if if you're not going out and taking your chance on seeing that emerging artist, well, that emerging artist is not going to stick around to become the established artist in five, ten years. So it, there's sort of a bit of a vacuum being created because right now a lot of the younger performers just aren't they aren't sticking around. They're 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 taking other jobs or they're leaving the province altogether. So it's yeah, I really see see that I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where it's going. So, so it's interesting when I heard you talk about that, I thought, Oh, I would not have thought that in Toronto, mm. but it's obviously, yeah. Similar situation everywhere. Maybe. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Well, also, I mean, those big shows, they, number one, they have an advertising budget. So people get to learn about those shows. Yeah, that's right. In an easier way. Yeah. Um, and, like a big yeah. blockbuster, a big bo- blockbuster gets, millions of people out on a weekend because they've got the money to put into the advertising and the small independent film doesn't have that money. So, you know, exactly. it's, it's a similar, similar dilemma. That's for sure. And what is the show that you're working on right now? <laughs> Funny. You should ask. We started talking about Luke. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the show that I'm doing right now is called stable home life with two horses. And it's a show that Luke and I developed, created, and we performed together. And we perform as ourselves. So uh, we got the idea a couple of years ago. We were both born in the year of the horse. And in 2014 was the year of the horse. I turned 48, Luke turned 24. I was exactly double his age. And I remember mm-hmm. saying to him, hey, from now on, like I get, I actually get younger in relation to you. This is really good. The ratio starts changing <laughs> because I've always been so much older than you. And we sort of joked about it a bit. And I, I said, yeah, I said, like, I, I said, I feel like we've got a lot of stories from, you know, the way he was raised kind of unconventionally. And he was a bit of a, well, I'm not a bit, he's a very individualistic uh, person. Luke is a stand up comedian now and has been for about four years. So, you know, he's, he's developed his own career. But along the way, you know, he had lots of challenges. He has he had a learning disability. So all through school, that was a challenge. And it just made for a lot of kind of interesting experiences. So we started talking one day and we were kind of trading some stories. And I said, you know, I said, I, I know about this show, which I didn't get to see. I said, I know about this show in Toronto uh, created by Ravi Jane called A Brimful of Asha. And I said, and he did a show where he, he wanted to do this solo show about his arranged marriage. And he told his mom he was going to, he was going to do this show. And she said, well, you can't do that show because you won't be telling the whole truth. And he said, that doesn't matter. You know, you probably know the show. Do you know the show I'm talking about? I know of the show. Yeah. Yeah. And so his mom said, you're not going to do that show on your own. If you do, I'm going to come and I'm going to tell people the truth. And I thought, wow, that's really brave and really scary. So Luke and I started talking about it and I said, yeah, you know, if we did that, that feels like a, like kind of an interesting experience. And I wonder what would happen. So we enlisted Lois Brown, who's a very great friend of mine and a colleague since I came home. She's a dramaturg and a director. I work with her all the time. And I said, Lois, uh, we're thinking about this show. Well, she had seen Brimful of Asha, loved the show. And she said, oh my God, okay, it'll be nothing like that but it'll be exactly like that. We're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to tell the truth. That's going to be my challenge to you. So we started writing this show. And as we told Lois some stories, because that's kind of how we did it. We did it more in Luke's stand-up tradition. So we started telling stories. And then there were times I'd tell a story and Luke would go, that that's not actually what happened. This is actually what happened. And hmm. I could not believe some of the truth behind some of the stories that, that I thought I'd known for you know <laughs> 20 years. And I was like, Oh my God. And he, you know, he started, I guess we both kind of started doing this confessional type thing of like, okay, this was really what was happening. Or this is what I was trying to protect you from. So we, we ended up coming up with, Oh my God. I think in the end we decided on about 
24 to 28 stories. And then when we ran them all, the show was too long. So uh, Lois said, okay, well, we can't have this many stories. Uh, you guys have to pick, you know, pick some. And our favorites were different. We couldn't decide. And I said, well, Lois, like, how about we let the audience choose what stories they want to hear? And so now we are, basically we have two wood horses on stage that we use just as our like kind of seats that we sit on when one or the other is telling the story. And, um, and we have a bucket, nice little horse feed bucket. And inside that are a whole bunch of cards with titles of stories that sometimes tell you nothing about what the actual story is going to be, but there are a cue. And so we, we let the audience pick, uh, are you, do you want to hear about cats or do you want to hear about the Pope Turkey? And so we get, let the audience choose. And then we, sort of trade off the stories uh, as the night goes on. We have a couple of stories we tell together, but mostly Luke has a story. I have a story or we have one that we go, wait, wait, that's not what happened. So it's a pretty, pretty neat format for the show. We almost think of it like a game show because sometimes, mm. sometimes we also ask the audience some questions like, Oh yeah, from what we've told you so far, like what would you think is the best parenting tip you could give us? Or what do you think was the worst moment uh, of what you've seen so far? And people, the thing is, sometimes because of the way the audience chooses the stories, some nights the show feels really like raunchy and edgy, and other times it feels kind of sweet and and nice. <laughs> hmm. I like the sweet and nice ones, and the raunchy and edgy ones always make me really nervous because I always think, "Oh, I seem like such a horrible person and a really bad <laughs> mom." But that was that was kind of part of the challenge. We just took it on and said, "Okay, well, you know, if we're gonna do this." then we just had to face being honest with each other and, and, and kind of exposing some of our faults. It, both of us get really nervous before the show because of that. Yeah. It, it, you said it opens this week? Yeah, it opens on Thursday night at the LSPU Hall. So we're going to run it for four, four shows. We have one matinee and three night shows. Okay, wow. Great. Yeah. And then what do you have, what do you have after that? Uh, well, actually, so uh, right after that, uh, there's a Women's Work Festival, which is a festival that I co-founded and I coordinate. And that's a festival of plays in progress that happens in St. John's. It's in its 10th year now. And uh, it's all new works by women, usually uh, from across the country. This year, we have one coming in from Nova Scotia and two local ones. Uh, but it's also our 10th anniversary celebration. So we've commissioned 10 writers uh, with Newfoundland roots, but who live across Canada to write 10 short pieces for us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a full week of uh, development workshops and readings of new plays. And then the week after that, I'm doing another show. This is all in the LSPU Hall. It's a crazy month there for me. I'm doing another show called Bonnie and Clyde, which was written by Adrian Yearwood of Toronto. And it's directed by Victoria Fuller from St. John's. And they're being presented down here. So rather than bring their whole huge cast down, they've cast four people locally. And I get to play Kumi Barrow, who is Clyde Barrow's mother in mm. Bonnie and Clyde. Nice. I'm really looking forward to that. It's a it's a big month for theater. I I work a lot, but I don't always work this much on stage. That's great. Yeah, it's it's a great month. Well, we're about at the end of our at the end of our our time here. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming on, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a real so pleasure, and actually, Phil, it's actually really good. I like I you know I find when I'm out here working in Newfoundland, it's, it's only when I tour things or when I visit Toronto and I talk to, you know, my theater compatriots that I really kind of get a temperature of what's happening in the mm. rest of Canada. And, and we often do feel like we're kind of working, you know, by ourselves, but it sounds like we actually have a lot more, you know, similar challenges and maybe hopefully uh, the rewards are similar too, because I, I know that, you know, I do have my days when I go, Oh boy, where's all this going and where's this leading? But the truth of it is, it is, you know, I've actually had a pretty, you know, pretty solid career and, uh, and I've gotten to work with some amazing people in the last 25 years. So who knows what the next, you know, 15 or 20 is going to bring if I hang in there. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great to hear from you. Really great to keep, keep up with you uh, on social media. And uh, thanks so much for having me. This has been a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you for an hour.
time I finished my second year, I was quite pregnant. And like, it just was very fortunate that his, he, his birth date uh, was predicted to be July, it turned out to be perfect. He came on yeah. the 7th, 8th of July. And uh, he was six weeks old when I went back for my third year. And I remember when I got pregnant, um, I think um, it was funny because I kept thinking, oh, they're all really skeptical. They mm. think I'm not coming back. But at that point, as a pregnant young woman, 23 years old, I didn't really know what my options were because I thought, well, now I, I got to work as soon as I get out of school because I, I got a child to raise. So I didn't see any other choice than to finish school. So I told them I was going to come back and they said, look, come back. And I remember Peter Wilde actually in the room, it was him and Heiner and Peter said, I think you just need to come back and take it one day at a time and see what happens. Mm. And I said, yeah, if you'll let me do that, that's what I'd like to do. And he said, yeah, of course we will. And that's what I did. I, like I never looked beyond the next day because every day getting to school was hard. There's that's no lie. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had, you know, a child. I had my my child's babysitter was across town. I lived in High Park. His sitter was in uh, lived in uh, Gerard and where was she? Gerard and Coxwell. And then the school was at King and River. So I basically crossed the city and then doubled back halfway to get to school every day. And then I'd get home. So because I was in third year, when I went back, uh, we also had, we had classes all day and then rehearsals all night. So I would usually get home like at midnight because I'd go get yeah. lit after, after rehearsal, usually at a student's house, <laughs> a first <laughs> or a second year would have them, or they'd come to the school and take care of them. And, uh, I was getting home at midnight and then getting up again, like five, six o'clock in the morning. So every day it was hard. And, you know, babies come with lots of illnesses and lots of needs. So yeah. I never, yeah, I never quite knew what the next day would bring. I was also really broke. So I was doing my own uh, laundry for cotton diapers and I was nursing. And yeah, it was, it wasn't an easy year. By the time the year was up, I was physically exhausted, but man, did I ever know myself better. I'll bet you did. <laughs> I knew a lot more about myself than I would have in any, yeah. you know, otherwise there's that, that's for sure. Hmm. Yeah. And I, and I, I got better as an actor. There's no doubt about that because suddenly uh, there was just something, it, there's just something that makes you a lot less selfish when you realize that there's another person that depends on you. That's true. I was actually going to say, I was going to suggest that maybe that might have also been because you were so tired. And I was tired. You, you cannot fake it when you're tired. That's so true. And I'll tell you one thing. I was certainly in touch with my emotions. <laughs> I always knew. You know, and there were just things. Uh, yeah, there, there, there was um, an appreciation for life somehow that I didn't hadn't had before and how delicate it was. I, I, it's really, it sounds a little bit corny to say it, but there was something that she feel a little pang of jealousy when I'm teaching them to my students, because I, I want to go back and do it all over again. I actually, I caught myself saying a little while ago that, that um, I would like to go back and do those things again, knowing what I know now. Yeah. Um, sort of with the wisdom of age and not the impatience of, of my youth. I know the zone of silence. Like, it. Oh, it'd be so nice to go back there. Yeah, it totally would. When you finished theater school, how long did you go straight back to Newfoundland or did you stay in Ontario for a while? I didn't go straight back because I auditioned for a couple of, of summer seasons and I got one. Uh, so I actually left school and went directly to Port Colborne and worked at the showboat theater that I don't know if that, theater still there, but they had a little summer season and I went down and worked there. I did, I performed in two shows and I was, I think I was the costume mistress for one in the middle because of course I had, you know, the, the costume background. They were like, Oh, we could keep you on the whole summer. And I went, yeah, of course I was a new mother. Cause I had Luke <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'll do that. So I stayed that summer. And while I was in 
um, Port Colborne performing, a friend of mine came to visit me and told me about an audition for a show back in Newfoundland. And I knew I was, at the time I'd planned to go back because me and my partner, Luke's dad, were getting married. So I thought, oh, I, I should audition. So I set up an audition. I can't even remember how I did it. I, I feel like I had a phone interview and she said, okay, yeah, you'll audition when you get back in St. John's. So I came back, I auditioned for her and she said, well, the show's cast. I, I can't hire you. And I probably did the smartest thing of my career. I said, well, isn't your show about rural Newfoundland? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, who in your cast is from rural Newfoundland? <laughs> and she said, no one. And I said, I think you need me. And what could she say to that? <laughs> she said, well, maybe. Um, okay, I'll do this. Why don't you come in and work with us for a couple of days? We'll try out. And if it works out, then I'll figure something out. And so after after the end of the first day, uh, I thought, oh, this is, you know, I, I didn't know how this was going. And then, and then I came back for my second day and the assistant director said, don't worry, don't worry. Your trial's over. We're hiring you today. <laughs> and that was it. Like I, I got that job and then I went basically from job to job. I, I, mm. I don't even think I've ever, I don't think I've ever auditioned for anything outside of Newfoundland since that. Cause one job led to the other, led to another. I, mm. I made a whole community and network here. And um, the only time I've left here to do shows is when I've toured things. And one time I did a co-production between RCA theater, our local St. John's uh, theater company and Tarragon. And I went to Tarragon to do mm. six weeks in Toronto. Mm. So I've had a pretty full career. here. I've been really lucky. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you sort of mentioned something in passing uh, about, uh, you mentioned your son, Luke, mm -hmm. and uh, you had Luke, so you were pregnant with Luke in second year? Yeah, I got pregnant mm -hmm. in the fall of second year. So by the doll exercises and stuff, I was so jazzed and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But I guess she didn't really see much potential there in the four or five of us who showed up. And we never had another drama club meeting. <laughs> that was a bit of a disappointment to me. Uh, but I did get a taste. And it was enough to tell me that, yep, this was something I wanted to do. Hmm. W were you surprised uh, when you finally started, started doing theater at, at what it actually meant? I was, in a way, because, you know, you, no matter what you grow up watching, you're never really quite prepared for the amount of work and the amount of thought that goes into a production. And no matter how big or small your part is, you know, you're, you're always on, you have to be thinking all the time. And so I, I think that was the part that surprised me. Uh, you know, when you're watching TV, you kind of go, okay, when the person walks off, they're sort of out of your experience but it's it's a very different yeah as as we all know when we work in theater you know once the show starts uh, you know there is that wonderful beautiful tension no matter how often you are on or off the stage that uh, you're suspended in from the time the the show goes up until the final curtain call yeah it, and, and it, those are beautiful more moments actually I, I i love those moments yeah so do i um, you, you, so doing, doing theater at, uh, at Niagara, mm -hmm. um, did you complete the program there or did you leave that to go elsewhere? Surprisingly I did because once I got there, I realized I loved the people, the students that were there doing techno theater loved their craft so much. And I ended up um, going, it was a two year program with an optional third I went back for the second year that I had to choose a specialization. So I chose a specialization in costumes, even though I actually loved carpentry too. And my carpentry teacher was actually quite disappointed that I didn't become a carpenter. In retrospect, so am I, because I, it would have really helped me when I renovated my house. <laughs> but I did learn a respect for power tools while I was there. And I've never been afraid to pick anything up. So hmm. I took that with me. But I stayed because the first year I did two shows. Uh, and then I saw an opportunity in the next year to just um, get a bit more of an enriched 
experience. And, and I did, I, I did another show at the, the, the very final one that year was absurd person singular, which was an Alan Akeburn show, but unlike most of the stuff that he's written. And I, I just had a ball. It was one of the best experiences of my, you know, early college life because I had a lead role. My parents came to see me as it turned out, it was my the only time my father ever saw me on stage because he died quite young, got sick the next year and died a year later. So it was the only time my father ever saw me on stage was that final production at uh, Niagara. So I, I did actually really enjoy and never regret any of those, uh, any of the time I spent there. Hmm. And did you go straight there from uh, straight from there to George Brown? Well, I'd hope to. I auditioned for George Brown because I, I went up for a visit to friends of mine who were at George Brown while I was still at Niagara, and I just fell in love with their program. I saw the period study, which is just you know the pinnacle for me of the study at George Brown, and I saw that and thought this is the school for me. I auditioned for that program and didn't get in. I got mm. into Humber and went to Humber for one year. And I, the whole time I was at Humber, even though I learned lots and I made incredible friends, some of whom I'm still friends with today, of course, there was just something about George Brown. They, they hooked me. So I went back to audition again. And I remember Peter Wilde saying, didn't we see you last year? <laughs> I, you did, but you didn't let me in the school. So I'm back. And he said, well, what if we're just another stepping stone on your way to, you know, to, to find the school you, of your dreams? And I said, well, this is it. I, I don't want to do anywhere else. <laughs> and I think that actually got me in. I, I don't that think probably it did. That probably did. Yeah. There's no way it was my audition. I didn't improve that much from one year to the next. I really <laughs> think it was those words. It, it, cut, it took a chance on me. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, Though that program uh, for so many people who who went through it is is pretty it's an intense program, and uh, is definitely uh, it changes you in a, in some some good, and I guess some people might some people everybody's mileage varies, but it definitely mm -hmm. is a is a challenging course. Um, totally, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change not one month, not one not one scene study, not one course, like everything about that. And like you said, there were things I didn't enjoy, but I, they came back to me, you know, at some point in my career for the last 25 years, they, those, everything I learned there has come back to me in some way. Well, it's, it's funny because it is a course that I remember when I was in first year, Peter Wilde said, um, something to the effect of, you may not understand the things that we're doing now, but one day in the future, you will understand exactly why we're doing it. And yeah. at the time I said, you are so full of shit is what I, I thought to myself. And then about 10 years later, I was like, oh, now I understand. I know the penny drops. And like, that's the thing, like the penny keeps dropping. I feel like, you know, like, and, uh, and it's true. eh? like, I, I, I remember having that moment too, where I was like, you know, we're young and we're thinking, oh my God, really, do we need to know this stuff? And yeah, the truth is you do. <laughs> well, it's funny because I remember, I remember thinking, you know, why are we taking all of, why are we spending all this time in theater history class? Exactly. And, you know, exactly. We're just being lectured at for an hour every, every week. But now of course I understand exactly why. I know. And like, like I've gone back and reread so many of those plays, <laughs> you know, he'd be very proud of us. I think, you know, Phil, he'd be very proud mm. to hear that. But I it's so. true. Yeah. And uh, I teach sometimes now. I, I've taught a couple of times at the theater school in Cornerbrook. Uh, I've taught as a master class teacher. And I've also taught here at Munn in their drama specialization. And I, I hear myself saying the same words that those teachers have said over the years to me mm -hmm. and doing remarkably a lot of the same exercises. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's it's funny how much you know those are the those are the exercises that we fall back on so often. Oh, absolutely! And I feel like I actually welcome to episode twelve of the Stageworthy podcast. I'm your host Phil Rickaby. On Stageworthy, I interview people who make theater, actors, directors, playwrights, and more, and talk to them about everything from why they chose the theater to their work process and everything in between. You can find Stageworthy on Facebook and Twitter at StageworthyPod, 
and you can find the website at stageworthypodcast.com. If you like what you hear, I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use and consider leaving a comment or rating. Ruth Lawrence is an actor, director, filmmaker, and artistic director of White Rooster Theater. She's co-founder and coordinator of the Women's Work Festival, now celebrating 10 years of developing new plays by women. She was named the Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council's Artist of the Year for 2011 and was honored with the Queen's Jubilee Medal in 2013. Ruth spoke to me from her home in St. John's, Newfoundland. Welcome uh, to the show, and uh, yeah. um, I'll start with with the the question that that I always start with, and that is, um, why did you choose to pursue theater? Well, I grew up in a really small place in Saint Saint Jacks, Newfoundland, which is in the middle of the south coast of Newfoundland, little town of two hundred people. And I didn't really have any good examples of theater uh, to use as my guide when I was growing up. But I, I, did, uh, I, I did learn through CDC that we had a very vibrant culture and there were tons of local regional programming uh, happening in Newfoundland at that time. So I was used to seeing our culture kind of reflected back to us in shows like The Wonderful Grand Band, Up at Hours, Skipper and Company. Some of them were variety shows. Some of them were sort of sitcoms and some were music shows. So I sort of grew up seeing ourselves reflected on TV. And even though I'd never seen a theater show, I felt that there was a career out there for me. Uh, so once I started getting pretty late into high school, I started investigating the possibilities. And the first school that I could find uh, that did not require an audition to get into, which really appealed to me because I didn't know what an audition was, was a technical theater school in Niagara College down in Welland. So I applied, wrote a really great letter, got some references got in. And that was really the start to my theater career. Because from there, I was allowed to audition for all the shows that the, that the center did. I had to be on crew sometimes, but I, by and large, I got to perform in those shows. And that was really the beginnings of my theater career. So really, my first experiences on stage were actually in Southern Ontario. So you had not, you didn't have exposure to theater itself until you started uh, like college. Yeah, that's right. I had a high school teacher who came through at one point who was going to start a drama club and we did one drama club uh, sort of meeting and I, you know, we did some rag 